Ebenezer family and friends. It is so good to be back on uh, this day that the Lord has made. I, I just want to first of all just uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do as a church family and friends and connecting. I've just been amazed at what God has been doing in this season, how he's been adding to the body, how many people are being encouraged um, by uh, the word of God and the things that he's allowed us to do uh, via ebcnc.com and our app and um, all the connectivity in the virtual world. Uh, I am I'm excited. Our Bible studies that we're having on Mondays, Tuesdays, and uh, Wednesdays are being viewed a lot and people are being encouraged. Just talked to someone the other day and they said they uh, take those Bible studies and are able to uh, go through the study at different times and to be encouraged. And I encourage you, uh, maybe there's some um, leading in your heart for more fellowship. And uh, I know with the Delta variant still out there, things that are going on, maybe you have some people that are around you that you want to invite over to your house and y'all can look at a Bible study together. You can pause it and uh, you can ask questions and then you can start it back up. And so that's just a tool uh, to help and assist in the edification process as we grow in the Lord. Just thank you for your giving. Um, whether it's um, via our uh, Tively app that's connected to the uh, app, the Ebenezer app, or maybe you're sending it into our secure mailbox or you're in our in-person services. We have our in-person services 845 and 1045, of course, our 10 o'clock online. So we have a lot of things going on uh, that uh, you can be encouraged by. Uh, as I was uh, meditating today, I was actually uh, thinking about uh, a particular scripture that came up in my devotion time, and I, I want to share it with you. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and starting at the 16th verse. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Isn't that a heavy scripture? I've just been processing that and just to read it and to really just focus in that as believers, we are the temple of God and God wants to dwell in us. That is amazing. I did a podcast on it and just asking the question, um, is this temple suitable for the presence of God. And that's why we've been teaching on the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you to really just fall head over heels in love with the Lord because he's doing such an amazing thing within this season and time of our world and our nation. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for who you are, uh, your grace and the mercy. Forgive us, Lord, for often taking for granted that we are the temple of the Most High God. You dwell in us, Lord. It's not like in the Old Testament where you would uh, come and sit for a period of time uh, in a physical place or upon uh, people, but Lord, you decided through your Son, Jesus Christ, to dwell in us via your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we are so blessed by that. So thank you, God. You know what's going on in our nation. Uh, this pandemic that still rages on, Lord, uh, storms in various places. Lord, I thank you for the scriptures uh, that are rising up even more in our hearts, letting us know that uh, we are in the end times. So thank you that in these dark days, uh, these days of struggles, that your light will shine through us, that more souls be saved and be brought to the knowledge of the truth of you. Lord, we love you and we magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen. These are the days of Elisha Declaring the word of the Lord, yes And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored And these are the days of great trials A famine in darkness and sword Still these are the days of the voices crying Prepare ye the way of the Lord Behold he comes Shining like the stars Riding on the clouds As the trumpet sounds Lift your voice Yield your belief Out of Zion's hill Salvation comes And these are the days of Ezekiel 
the dry bones becoming his flesh, yes. And these are the days of your servant, David, building the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are white in the world. And we are the laborers that are in your vineyard, declaring the world. How many of you know that there's no God like Jehovah? How many of you know there's no God like Jehovah? Okay, when I ask you to, you're going to have to sing this. You're going to have to say, no God like Jehovah. No God like Jehovah, okay? No God like Jehovah. Here we go. Help me sing. There's no, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Sing, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 He walks on water. He heals the sick. He raised the dead. Five thousand souls he fed. There's no God like Jehovah. No, not Buddha. No, not Harry Krishna. There's none like him. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Come on, y'all. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like one more time. There's no God like Jehovah. Yes. One more time. Yes. Behold, he comes riding on the cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet sound. Lift your voice, give up to believe. Out of Zion Hill, salvation comes. Let's give God a hand. Well, we're back into uh, the study of the day, dealing with the Holy Spirit and. I believe that you've been blessed. I know I have been blessed by this journey. I am just um, encouraged as I've gone through these scriptures. And there's still more scriptures that we're going to uh, connect with uh, how prevalent the Holy Spirit is. Uh, I've been talking to the congregation and talking to Bible studies. And um, also I uh, want to put this forth that you should be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit uh, in this season and time because we've been teaching on it. But also we become more aware of our flesh. Any amens out there? Yes, as we recognize that still small voice and the powerful Holy Spirit on the inside, we realize that there is a war. There is a struggle that's going on on the inside of us. Uh, we've been uh, focusing on that uh, big topic scripture of Genesis 1, uh, 1 and 2. And then that, that, that second verse is the conversion process where it talks about the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of waters. That whole change, that creative process, and that powerful Holy Spirit, uh, God, is living inside of us. As said before, we are the temple of God. Man, that should make you just give a, a, a thought of praise and shout of exhilaration to Him. And we've been dealing with the power of the Spirit. Before we go any, uh, way, any further, I just want to uh, just go in a word of prayer. And I ask you to pray with me as we just think about it. I'm just thinking about how good God has been and uh, His presence that dwells in us. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for who you are. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Uh, please forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness, Lord. And I pray for maybe there's someone that's looking in or listening in that doesn't know you. 
Would you help them uh, today, Lord, to confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that, Father, you raised them from the dead and you said they would be saved. Lord, let them know the reality of Ephesians 2 and 8. Uh, for by grace we have been saved uh, through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Lord, help them to receive that wonderful gift from you. Now, Lord, uh, as we enter into this word, Holy Spirit, would you teach us and guide us and lead us into all truth? Make this word so plain, so easy to be understood that even a small child can be transformed to be like you. Uh, Father, we just love you. And we thank you for shining through us brightly. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to uh, focus in with me on Ephesians chapter 4, the book of Ephesians. An awesome book uh, in the uh, fourth chapter. And uh, focus in, let's pinpoint in on that 30th verse. As I'm thinking about the book of Ephesians, uh, time frame is about 80, 60, 61. And uh, Paul the Apostle writes this uh, power-packed book uh, to a group of believers that just don't realize how blessed they are. Any amen. So often we can, again, take for granted what God has done in us and doing in us through the conversion process of the Holy Spirit. Man, I'm just thinking without the Lord in our lives, oh, things would be so different. And even with the fight of our flesh to have the Holy Spirit on the inside. Uh, listen to this verse, Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I want to speak from a title today, How Not to Hurt a Friend. How Not to Hurt a Friend. Well, then that, that, I, I really want you to grab that. How Not to Hurt a Friend. As we uh, think about this entirety of the book and uh, this group of believers that really needed to grow in the Lord and this is what this book helps them to understand the power of the Spirit and the transformation process that God is doing on the inside. Uh, when you look at those previous uh, chapters they all are summed up that uh, Paul has encouraged them to unify in the Lord, unify in the Spirit of God so that they can recognize that it's not about them but it's all about God. Let's jump into this section, Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. It reads, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Here's our first point. We walk differently. Yes, we walk differently. Paul the Apostle, uh, teaching to uh, these uh, believers uh, in this church, uh, he, he wants to encourage them, let them know that they've come out of the background of heathenism. They've come out from an old life, and now they're stepping into a new, invigorated, bright light that's filled, life that's filled with power in God's glory. And so often in our lives, we need this encouragement that we have come out of darkness into the marvelous light. We walk differently. I, I was thinking about this, and uh, many you probably don't know of this example. Uh, my wife, uh, when she was uh, very young, a toddler, uh, she was very pigeon-toed, and so her uh, parents decided uh, that they were going to put braces on her and try to straighten up her her feet because she walked differently. Uh, Bianca made such a fuss that they said forget the braces and they just left her legs alone and even today she walks pigeon toe but her walking differently was very attractive to me and um, I think was a big reason that we were connected together and been together some 29 plus years so walking differently is important so often we've been taught in this life as we have been uh, raised up to just try to be like someone else and Paul the Apostle he really sums it up in a 
amazing way. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. As I put God first in my life, I want you to follow me, but realize I am just exemplifying. I'm being an example of Christ. And it's the same way in our lives. We need to really focus in on Christ and what he's doing uh, in us via the Holy Spirit. Look closely at Ephesians 4.17, that second part. It says that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Saints, there must be a difference in our lives, in our walk in our talk. I'm going to deal with that a little later. There must be a difference how we carry ourselves. We need to look different than the world. We don't uh, look at the same things the world looks at. We don't uh, deal in the same things that the world. We have been brought out of that life into a life that's focused on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we want to learn how not to hurt or frame the Holy Spirit in our lives. Look at Ephesians 4.19 that first part, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. Isn't that an indictment of our world? I am, I'm seeing so uh, many people becoming callous in their hearts, not even caring anymore, uh, shooting people in broad daylight and not even having any remorse when they're caught, when they uh, go before a judge. Uh, they're not sorry. They're not sorry for the pain that they've caused the family. And, and as we are thinking about that, this is totally opposite of what God is doing in us. God makes us sensitive. He makes us sensitive to the things that are going on. As you're seeing these things that are occurring in our society, these atrocities, there should be some, some tears sometimes. There should be some, some prayers for the families and the things that are going on. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is so often grieved because we are not allowing ourselves to really embrace uh, the, the love and the compassion God wants to bring up in us to reach out to these people that are going astray, to pray for folks that really on the verge of losing it. Our place in this society is so important. God wants to use us that souls can be brought to the knowledge of, of Jesus, that they can see that God is real and he is powerful. How not to hurt a friend. Look at Ephesians 4, 20 um, through 24. But you have not so learned Christ if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Here's another point. We've kind of been talking about this. Put off the old and put on the new. Put off the old and put on the new. When, when the Holy Spirit uh, comes in us via salvation, us accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is a change. We, we've been saying it over and over. There is a transformation that's taking place. And literally, we are encouraged to put off those old ways, put off those old thoughts. How do we do that? We get into God's Word, the transformation of our mind, and we become more sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2, 20, it reveals something very powerful. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, Paul writes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Hallelujah. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is a change. We no longer live to ourselves. And I know that's tough because our flesh rises up and it wants it to be about us, but it's about Christ and what he's done for us. Shirley A. Walker, an amazing song uh, that she uh, writes and sings. She says, I moved from my old house. I moved from my old friends. I moved from my old way of strife. Thank God I moved out to a brand new life. There ought to be some hallelujahs out there. He changed my old way with words. He changed my old level mind. He changed my heart and gave me a new start. Thank God I moved out to a brand new new life. And I, I love uh, how she sums it up. She said, can't you see I'm a new man? Don't you know I got a new name? And one day I'll live that new land because I moved out to a brand new life. How not to hurt a friend. 
This is so important as we progress through these scriptures to understand that God has changed us. Anybody a change out there just in the, the chat, just put change. And as you're sitting in your living rooms or you're on your break, just say, I'm changed. I am different. And it is okay and embrace that you are different. You are a saint. You are the child of the most high God. God has made uh, you his temple and wants to dwell. We must be different. Look at Ephesians 4.20. Wow, we're, we're, we're digging into this. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Here's another point. It's a powerful one. Stop lying. Stop lying. Now, I, I, I know some of you may think, and we're going through this, is this written to believers? Yes, it is written to believers, but they are growing believers, and they have issues that are going on. And Paul the Apostle, as he's led by the Holy Spirit, is letting them know of some things that grieve the Holy Spirit, that hurt our friend. We must be a Spirit-led people that stop living deceitful ways, stop living uh, ways that are darkness, and we need to be a living transparent lies. We need to stop lying. I remember as a, a baby Christian growing up in my, my house, I, I was truly saved. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, but there were some instances that I had gotten in trouble and I was before my parents and I had a tendency to try to lie. But the issue is I, I tried to, to lie and put the story, but I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit. I turned red in the face. I started stuttering because the Holy Spirit was moving so strongly in my life I just couldn't put it together and it's the same thing in our lives as 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 Christians there's sometimes that we're going to be tempted to be deceitful we're going to be tempted to lie but please understand that this is serious that we are actually hurting our friend when we live in deceitful ways Revelation 21 8 really hits home about this stop lying it says but the cowardly unbelieving abominable murders sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars, type in liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Yes, we are supposed to live lives of truth. That means on our job. That means in our family. That means that everywhere we go, we live in the truth. Look at Ephesians 4.26. As we're being led of the Holy Spirit, not wanting to hurt our friend, there's some other things that Paul the Apostle brings up. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. I told you this is a heavy day. We're digging into this. Here's another point. Anger, wrath, and the devil. Anger, wrath, and the devil. The, the mandate is not against anger, but the mandate is against uh, anger leading into sin. This, this, is, this is so important. We, we all can, can have a tendency to get angry at times, but the problem is, do we allow that anger to enter into causing us to sin? Even Jesus uh, got angry, and, and as you look at that, some call it righteous indignation, but the scriptures, Mark 3, uh, 1 through 4, it says, and he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand so they watched Jesus closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him and he said to the man who had the withered hand step forward then he said to them is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil or to save life or to kill but they kept silent so Jesus was was constantly challenging the thought pattern it was laws that was set up that you weren't supposed to heal you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath and they saw healing as work but look at Mark 3 5 very powerful and when Jesus had looked around at them with anger being grieved by the hardness of their heart. How how not to hurt a friend. I, I, I find this very powerful when you begin to process this because he was grieved. He was grieved. Remember, he's God manifested in the flesh, the Holy Spirit uh, without limit on the inside. His heart was grieved by the callousness. We talked about that, the cold heartedness of the people that are around. Being grieved by the hardness of their heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it 
pulled out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But the Spirit of God also gives us a stark warning to understand, okay, God gives us this and allows us to enter in the anger we don't want to see in James 1, 19 and 20. It says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear slow to speak, slow to wrath, James 1.20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So within that whole process, we don't want to hurt our friend, the Holy Spirit that's on the inside. We want to be quick to lean to his understanding in all situations. And there are some times that righteous indignation will rise up uh, uh, inside of us, but we need to make sure that we're always giving it to the Lord. Uh, look closely at Ephesians 427 this is the warning it says nor give place to the devil when these emotions rise within us we always have to be aware that the devil wants to step in there ought to be some hallelujahs out there he wants to get in our minds how often have you started on a road you took a step and anger began to rise up within you and you had a choice to give it to the Lord and change it to another point but you allowed it to continue to churn on the inside of you and the enemy walks in and and now the devil has a foothold. The Lord kind of put this, this quotation on my mind, and I, I want you to really meditate on it. It says, when we choose not to follow the leadership of the Spirit, we automatically open up a place for the devil. Amen. I want to read that again. When we choose not to follow the leadership of the Spirit, we automatically open up a place for the devil. When we hurt our friend, we open up a place for the enemy to come in. Look at Ephesians 4.28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Here's another one. Stop stealing. Yes, stop stealing. These are ways to truly hurt our friend, the Holy Spirit. It's like, Pastor, I don't, I don't steal. I, 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 maybe I used to steal, but I don't steal now. Uh, why is this so important? Why is Paul the Apostle writing this to believers? They, they, they shouldn't be stealing. Yes, but now we have to look at it on a, a deeper level. I was reading an article in Christianity Today, and they wrote this, man, and it really was an examination of the body. It says, one hope that Christians do not engage in such blatant stealing, but are there forms of theft to which Christians are vulnerable? Are you listening to me? If theft is understood as taking something from another so that, if replaceable at all, money and effort is required, then surely it is theft to waste one another's time. Ouch. If we are careless about keeping appointments or keeping them on time, we are stealing something precious. If we waste time on the job, we are taking money under false pretenses. Ouch again. How is that different from selling somebody something and then uh, serendipitously uh, taking it back? I I'm telling you, man, that is an examination. We may not physically run into a store and take something, but some of us are really stealing and different ways and we are hurting our friend. Lord, help us in this. Look closely at uh, Ephesians 4.28, that second part, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has a need. When we grasp this, that God wants us again to be transparent at all times, not being deceitful, not stealing. Uh, we, now we can be led to become cheerful givers and that's what we teach in 2 Corinthians 9.7. So so let each one give as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And how not to hurt a friend, this whole process of being led of the Holy Spirit. Now our mindset is changed. We don't uh, live a life of stealing, but now we live a life of giving. There ought to be some hallelujahs. Look at Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but... What is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? I tell you, we, we're taking it to another level. Here's another point. Watch your mouth. Yes, watch your mouth. There ought to be some believers out there say, Pastor, 
I said, what are you talking to me? I'm telling you, so often our mouths can get us in trouble and what we don't realize when we allow our mouth to get out ahead of us, we are hurting our friend. We're grieving the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, it brings out, it says no corrupt word. It means that we shouldn't bring out any frivolous or empty words or idle or worthless words. Arthur Farstead, he actually sums this up great. He says our, our words should be edifying. It should result in building up the hearers appropriate. It should be suitable to the occasion. Gracious. It should impart grace to the hearers. Please hear me. The only way that we can keep from hurting uh, our friend, the Holy Spirit, is to submit ourselves as we look at these scriptures, submit ourselves to his leadership so that there can be a change on the inside that's not just something we walk up to the front of a church or not something we just say Jesus come into our lives, but we actually see a change with how we act, how we talk and what we do, the processes of our mind. Look at Ephesians 4.30. Here's a powerful verse. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's a longer point. Our disobedience brings pain to the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, I want to say that again. Our disobedience brings pain to the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, when you break this down, uh, it's a very significant point that comes out. When I started looking at this definition, it actually it, it could be translated, I pain, grieve, or vex. So this, this grieving the Holy Spirit, really you could put in and say, I pain the Holy Spirit. How often in our lives have we pained the Holy Spirit? And I know I've messed up in my life and God forgive me and I want to do better because I brought physical pain to the Holy Spirit. He is a person. Look at Ephesians 4.30, that second part. It says, the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In essence, God has given us the Holy Spirit and that seal for redemption is like he's put a stamp on us. He's doing so much in the inside side of us and changing us but yet we allow the flesh to come up so often and we hurt our friend we actually bring him pain and I'm telling you saints of God when we become more sensitive to this as said before now we're more willing to get into God's word to pray more to fast more to seek his face so that we don't bring pain to the Holy Spirit the spirit solidifies this thought in Philippians 3 20 I love this when it says for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship, this place is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as we're getting closer to God and listening to his Holy Spirit, we can sense God's authority rising up in us. First uh, John 3, 2 says it like this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Him, for we shall see him as he is. How not to hurt a friend. God is saying that I'm changing you. Every day you should become more like me and you should be hurting the Holy Spirit less. Yes, we shouldn't be bringing more pain to him. As we grow in God, we should be flowing in what God's will and purpose is for our lives. Look at Ephesians 4.31. Wow, this, this, is, this is speaking to somebody. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Here's another point. Put it away. Yes, put it away. When, when we hold these things, this anger, this wrath, evil speaking within our heart, we are bringing pain to the Holy Spirit. We're hurting our friend. Yes, you see, you, you thought it was about you. It's not about you. It's about God's redemptive plan that he's doing on the inside of you, the connections that he wants to make, and you're holding on to that stuff. You've got to physically put it away. You've got to make a, a decision within your life. God is it's about you and I'm going to follow you no matter what. You've got to tell your flesh that the Holy Spirit lives within me and I'm going to follow him. We've got to know that somebody's always looking at us. 
Yes, it, it doesn't matter. You're like, this doesn't, this is not hurting anybody. It is hurting people. People are looking at you. I, I oftentimes I, I'm connected with different people in different places and I, I can see them and they may be angry and they talk certain ways and then something in the conversation will come up. I, I'll say, you know, I'm at Ebenezer and then they'll start talking. They'll realize there's a difference about me and then I, it's a pastor and, and then immediately so many times they, they change. All of a sudden they start talking Christian talk and, you know, how Hallelujah and praise the Lord. They were just cussing a, a, a few moments ago and they were just going through and so anger and clamor was coming up. But when they found out I was a representative, now there's a change in their life. And it used to happen a whole bunch some, some, some years and years ago. But now I'm finding out people don't care. They're just showing who they are from day in and day out. And then we have to ask ourselves people who have confessed that they're saved and yet they're not sensitive to what God is doing. Maybe they're not saved and God is saying you are hurting me so much even as believers and you won't take the time to begin to change more and more look at this final verse because it really comes to a point of us not wanting to hurt a friend uh, Ephesians 4 32 and be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you here's the final point we forgive because he forgave us. If you were in our Bible study uh, the other day, I actually uh, quoted this and brought it up. We forgive because he forgave us. Yes, as believers, we, we know we have truly been saved and delivered and set free. And we may have a tendency, the flesh to rise up and anger to be there that we wanted to, uh, we, we won't allow it in ourselves to go into sin. But we was like, no, no, he's forgiven me. I am not going to hold on to this unforgiveness. I am not going to be mean. I'm going to be tender hearted to those that are around me, whether they're good to me or not good to me, because I know I have the Holy Spirit on the inside and I don't want to hurt a friend. I, I think one of the most tender hearted examples of Jesus walking in this and being our example is John 13 and 1. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Yes, Jesus walked in this love, but he knows. He knows their choices. He knows what they're going to do. John 13 2 and supper being being ended, the devil have already been put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Notice within the scripture, Judas Iscariot is right there in the midst and the devil has entered in. He's found a foothold. Uh, Judas had found a way to hurt the Holy Spirit over and over again. But look at John 13, 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Oh, what a master, what a teacher, what a wonderful example of walking in the way of the Holy Spirit in spite of the issues that are around in John 13, 5. And said, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. I'm telling you, he washed those that would betray him. He washed the feet of those that would deny him. He washed the feet of those who would run away from him. And that's why the cross of Calvary is so important. Jesus going to that cross, nails in his hands and nails in his feet and carrying our sins and bearing our grief. And he dies on the cross of Calvary. They put him in the cold tomb, but he gets up on the third day with all power and all glory so that we could be saved finally with God's power and his glory. And the Holy Spirit could come on the inside of us and we could walk in a way that we would not hurt our friend. Yes. The Holy Spirit dwells in the believer. And so often we get so focused on this world and our desires and our thoughts that we hurt our friend, the one that Jesus died for on the cross of Calvary so that we could receive that friend. He died on the cross of Calvary for us so that we could receive the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And so often, we just kind of push them down, trying to do it our own way. But as we see in these scripture, there has to be a change. We, we got to walk differently. We got to look at things in a different way. We got to stop lying. We got to stop stealing. We need to put off the old and put on the new. We've got to forgive. 
because God has forgiven us. Oh, what a blessing to be saved and delivered and to have God's powerful spirit on the inside of us. If you're out there and you don't know him, I'm telling you, as you dig into the scriptures, the only way you can walk like this is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And I'm telling you, this is a journey, a grace journey through faith, this gift that God has given us. For the believers out there that are saved, I encourage you, man, get more in God's word. Let's not hurt our friend that dwells on the inside of us. Let's make him happy. Let's make him joyous because we are finally submitting ourselves more and more to what God would have us to do. It's going to be tough, man. There's going to be some fights that are on within inside of us, but greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. I encourage you, if you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, connect with a fellowship, connect with a body that you can continually be encouraged and grow in the Lord because it's going to take all of the body. We are the temple of God. And as we flow together and we connect together as a body, wow, what wonderful things can happen in this day and these times. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Lord, first I just lift up, forgive us. Forgive myself, forgive the body, forgive the individuals, Lord, all out there that are listening and looking in. Lord, we have grieved you. We have hurt the Holy Spirit so often. But Lord, today, a new day, we, we want to do better. God, we want to watch our mouths. We want to watch what we think. We want to watch what our eyes focus in on, Lord. We want to watch how we carry ourselves. We want to live a transparent life. We want to forgive quickly, Lord. Thank you, God for your grace and mercy in our lives. Father, we just give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. How many know that God's been good? I know he's been good to me. Has he been good to you? All right. God has been so good to me. God has been so good to me. Even a blind man can see just how good God's been to me. Let me tell you that God has been so good to me. Can y'all help me sing it? God has been so good to me. Can I get a witness tonight now, y'all? God has been so good to me. Even a blind man can see just how good God's been to me. Let me tell you that God, God has been so good to me. Let me do that one more time. God has been so good to me. Can I get a witness today now, y'all? God has been so good to me. Even a blind man can see just how good God's been to me. Let me tell you that God, God has been so good to me. It wasn't the alarm clock that woke me this morning. And let me live to see a brand new day. It's nothing I've done so good. I haven't lived the way I should. But it's because of God's mercy and grace I can tell you God, God has been so good to me Can I get a witness tonight now, y'all? God has been so good to me Even a blind man can see Just how good God's been to me Let me tell you that God, God has been so good to me a lot of money in the bank. Don't a lot of people know my name. I don't drive a Mercedes Benz. Not a big house that I live in. But I can stand here tonight and proclaim. God has been good. Been so good to me. Can I get a witness tonight now, y'all? God has been so good to me. 
Even a blind man can see just how good God's been to me. Let me tell you that God, God has been so good to me. Let me do that last verse one more time. I don't have a lot of money in the bank. Don't a lot of people know my name. I don't drive a Mercedes Benz. Not a big house that I live in. But I can stand here tonight and proclaim God has been good, has been so good to me. Can I get a witness tonight now, y'all? God has been so good to me. Even a blind man can see just how good God's been to me. Let me tell you that God, God has been so good to me. Let me sing that one more time. God, God has, God has been so good to me. Can I get a witness tonight now, y'all? God has been so good to me. Even a blind man can see just how good God's been to me. Let me tell you that God, God has been so good to me. Amen. Hope God's been good to you because I know he's been good to me.